If you like cars, or even if you don't like cars, Vauxhall has very likely been a big part of your life. If you haven't owned one, you've probably hired one, or been driven around in one, or seen them day in day out on the streets. And for good reason, Vauxhall has been pumping out affordable mainstream cars for decades. But its fortunes have gone up, then down, up, then down, up, then down, and finally up and then sort of down over the last 162 years it's been in business. So let's dig into the Vauxhall story. The Vauxhall story starts appropriately enough in Vauxhall, which is now a borough of Greater London. In 1857, a guy called Alexander Wilson started Alexander Wilson & Company to build steam engines and pumps. Remember, this was a time before practical internal combustion engines, and in the 19th century, steam engines were powering everything from boats to trains to pumps to keep mines dry. They focused on small boats and launches and did okay, but finances weren't looking too good by the 1890s. The now 57-year-old Alexander Wilson left the company in 1894, and a year later the company went bankrupt. It was restructured and in 1897 renamed to the Vauxhall Ironworks. That same year, Fred Hodges was made head of the drawing office. Fred had an automobile passion and began enthusing the company to make big changes to the company for the 20th century. It started with their first petrol engine, the five horsepower Jabberwock, which they would sell to power small boats. Steam was so 19th century and Vauxhall was changing with the times. Fred believed this engine could also be used to power a car, so designed the Model 719 in 1903. The car looked like a marine engine bolted to carriage and bicycle parts, which in some sense it was, but it was smarter under the skin. To try to make the car as light as possible, and because of his boat construction experience, Fred created the first unibody car. The car was improved in 1904, the engine gained one extra horse, and the car got a reverse gear, and the dodgy tiller steering system was abandoned in favour of a regular steering wheel. To help it sell, the car was driven in the London to Glasgow reliability trial, although they probably didn't stop off at McDonald's. In those days, it wasn't a race to see how fast you could get somewhere, it was to see if you could get there at all. With sales of these newfangled cars starting to take off, and with problems with the lease on the Vauxhall factory, the company looked for new, larger premises. Luton was looking to attract new business after the decline of the hat-making industry. They created an attractive package to lure Vauxhall Ironworks, and cars built there were doing so well that by 1907 the company was renamed to Vauxhall Motors. Fred Hodges had been the early visionary behind Vauxhall's early cars, but when he took a leave of absence, a new hire, Lawrence Pomeroy, took the initiative and became the powerhouse behind Vauxhall's next cars. In those early days of motoring, it was only the very rich that could afford these expensive playthings, and Vauxhall focused on the fast, sporty cars that they wanted. The first car Lawrence made won several trials and hill climbs, and was developed into the successful A-Type. He also produced the 1913-1398 that was the first car guaranteed to go 100 miles an hour. But his crowning achievement was the 1911 Prince Henry, after the motor trials that were named for Prince Henry of Prussia. With the car clocking up win after win, road-going versions were snapped up quickly. Vauxhalls were very popular with the Russian nobility, and Vauxhall opened a Russian sales office, but it was a short-lived affair with the decided lack of rich Russians after the Communist Revolution of 1917. The First World War left Britain penniless, and rich people's playthings like fast cars weren't really selling. With Vauxhall sales drying up, they looked around for a potential suitor. Many people, me included, think General Motors must have bought Vauxhall in the 1960s or 70s, but GM picked up Vauxhall in 1925 for two and a half million dollars. The bailout made sense for Vauxhall, but there are many reasons why the purchase made a lot of sense for General Motors. GM was locked in a battle for car sales with Ford, and Ford had already expanded to the UK in 1909, and was assembling cars there in 1911. 
To compete with Ford, they needed to expand to sell cars in other parts of the world. Vauxhall was known for their high-end cars, and the Vauxhall name would give GM's mass-market car some cachet. With the 1929 Wall Street crash, the GM purchase likely saved Vauxhall from bankruptcy. In the 20s and 30s, small inexpensive cars were the growth market, with the Ford Model T selling over 16.5 million cars around the world. It's tempting to think Vauxhall would build GM cars in the UK, but with smaller roads and a different customer, GM let Vauxhall produce its own cars. The first major car to come out was the 1930 Vauxhall Cadet. With Vauxhall free to raid GM's part bin, they fitted the first synchromesh gearbox to appear on a British car. The Cadet was sold for the low, low price of just £280, but by 1937 Vauxhall was selling a unibody Vauxhall 10.4 for just £168, also offering it as the Bedford HC. By offering cars at such competitive prices, they were showing they could produce cars at scale and control costs. Vauxhall had completed its transformation from a high-end car maker to mass producer. But Vauxhall wasn't the only European car company GM had their eyes on. In 1929 they purchased Opel from Germany. Opel was a little different as it was already a mass market car manufacturer, and in fact by 1937 they had the largest car plant in Europe. GM's plans for European domination would be interrupted by someone else's plans for European domination. Although it's surprising that Opel's German factories were churning out civilian cars until the autumn of 1940, over a year after the war had started. Vauxhall's factories were given over to making helmets, rocket parts and Churchill tanks. They continued to produce Bedford lorries and buses for the war effort at a new plant suitably in Dunstable in Bedfordshire. Opel was initially spared from the Nazi war machine, likely because Hitler didn't want to tip off an American company as to what they were doing. But with aircraft and tank parts desperately needed by 1942, they were pressed into service. With these plants now a part of the war effort, Allied bombers targeted and destroyed the Opel factories. It's ironic that American bombers were charged with destroying an American-owned factory. After the dust cleared, GM had to start from scratch with Opel, not just because the factories were destroyed, but because some of them were located in the now communist East Germany. GM considered throwing in the towel, but decided to continue production. It would take until December 1947 until car production began again. After the war, Vauxhall restarted production of the 10.4, but middle class Britain just didn't really have the cash. The company found itself selling larger and more expensive cars to those that could afford them, and the government encouraged British companies to export to help restart the struggling economy. But Vauxhalls like the 10.4 would start to be built in other parts of the world, such as Indonesia. With the improving British economy, in 1948 Vauxhall released two new models to capitalise on this growth, the large Vauxhall Velox and medium Vauxhall Wyvern. Both did well selling in their hundreds of thousands, and by 1953 Vauxhall was producing 100,000 cars a year. They offered a bit of futuristic American glamour in a dowdy, austere post-war Britain, but respectable middle-class Britain bought them in their droves. In the 1950s, the large Velox was replaced by the Vauxhall Cresta, with the medium Wyvern being replaced by the Victor. The Cresta would become the personal transport of the Queen herself, but it took Americana to the next level, with fins at the rear, curved glass and oodles of chrome. But it was the Vauxhall Victor that really took off, selling 1.3 million. The stylish rear end, with the exhaust pipe on the super, discharging through the bumper, door locks at both sides of the car, the flashing turn indicators way up above the tail lights, a handsome sensible instrument panel right beneath the driver's eye, a good solid handbrake with a high speed release, a five position main switch. You use the key only to unlock the switch. After that, the switch itself is turned to put on the auxiliary circuits, the main ignition circuit, and to start the engine. Vauxhall would continually update the styling of both cars, keeping up with the latest fashionable styling. 
By the end of the 1950s, cheap and cheerful cars like the Morris Minor, Ford Anglia and Austin Mini were becoming affordable to nearly everyone. Vauxhall realised they needed a small car to compete, so designed the Vauxhall Viva. For the first time they would work with Opel, producing a common floor pan that would be used for both the Viva and the Opel Record. But they didn't make it easy on themselves, because Opel used metric and Vauxhall imperial measurements throughout the entire process. The Luton plant had expanded and expanded since 1905, but with the company expecting big things from the new Viva, they realised they needed a new factory. It was built at Ellesmere Port, across the Mersey from the Triumph Speak plant near Liverpool. The Viva was a success, selling over one and a half million cars, and it was also popular around the world, becoming a top seller in Canada as the Envoy Epic. Vauxhall tried its hand at motorsports in the late 60s and early 70s with the 2 litre Viva GT and Forenza having some success, but the road going Forenza was a beast with a top speed of 120 miles an hour and a 0 to 60 time of 8 seconds. The 50s and 60s were a boom time for many car manufacturers, and Vauxhall was one of them, but as the 60s turned into the 70s, Vauxhall's fate wasn't looking too good. Ford's complete and compelling range was overshadowing the Viva, Cresta and Victor, and Vauxhalls were developing a reputation for being rust prone and unreliable. By the early 70s Vauxhalls UK market share was down to 7.5%, and GM were thinking of closing the company. Workers were enduring three day working weeks, and empty production lines made for low morale. But Vauxhall kept trying new things to return to success. The first was better corrosion protection. The second was saving development money by using GM and Opel vehicles. The 1975 Vauxhall Chevette was based on the GM T-Car platform that was used by 36 other vehicles around the world. And Vauxhall's new family car would be the 1975 Vauxhall Cavalier, a rebadged Opel Ascona that was built on GM's worldwide J platform that would be used by the American Chevrolet Cavalier. But it would take until the 1980s until Vauxhall would once again become a top seller. The improved Mark II Cavalier was joined by the Super Mini Vauxhall Nova and Hatchback Astra, producing a solid lineup that could be sold to fleets alongside their luxury Carlton and Senator. Vauxhall even added the sporty Calibra to the mix in 1989. But although Vauxhall was riding high, it was a shadow of its former self. Design was being done by Opel in Germany, with Vauxhall little more than marketing and manufacturing, and it's telling that Vauxhall's corporate headquarters were moved into the old design and testing building. Ford and Vauxhall were locked into a fleet battle into the 1990s. Company cars were popular because they were an untaxed employee benefit. Fleet sales slowed when the tax loophole was closed, and the remaining fleet sales were going to more prestige cars like the BMW 3 Series. Vauxhall had to retreat from the luxury car market as German luxury car makers with their fancy badges took sales, leaving Vauxhall with the low margin small and medium car sector. But small and medium car sales were still good, with the Cavalier being the 1993 number one selling car in the UK. Vauxhall launched an all-terrain vehicle as it was called at the time, the Frontera in 1991. Yes, it was a rebadged Isuzu MU, but it was built in the UK and used Vauxhall Opel engines. It would be joined by the larger rebadged Isuzu Trooper as the Vauxhall Monterey in 1994. But you shouldn't underestimate the power of Jeremy Clarkson's infamous review of the Vauxhall Vectra in 1996. The car was the follow-up to the Cavalier, and his review was a scathing attack on its blandness, with people singing, I am bored in the background. One rep tellingly says in the review, I think the back looks like the BMW. So the best thing he could say about the car was it was a bit like a car he'd rather have. The review was rather unfair, but it was a great story to tell down the pub, and Vauxhall's image soon became one of dependable, but dull cars. The Super Mini Nova was now the Corsa. With Nova being Spanish for doesn't go, the Spanish workers must have had a quiet chuckle to themselves while sticking the badges on the back. By the late 1990s, there was a clear demand for people carriers or MPVs. Vauxhall tested the water with the Sintra, based on the Chevy Venture U-body platform that would be used for the ill-fated Pontiac Aztec. 
Apparently Opel and Vauxhall left the naming of the car up to a computer, which didn't seem to be the wisest idea, especially as it came out with the name Sintra. After scathing reviews and being ranked JD Power's least satisfying car to own, the car was quietly retired. It was clear that GM were trying to build one car for the whole world and satisfying no one in the process. And with GM having money problems, new Vauxhalls were going to be hard to finance. The smaller 1999 Zafira was a much more pleasant MPV and was more popular with innovative foldable rear seating. It was joined in 2003 by the even smaller Mariva, and Vauxhall tried the innovative Signum large car that sat a little higher to provide bags of internal room. But when I say Vauxhall made these cars, by now it was Opel making the cars and slapping a Vauxhall badge on the back. And Vauxhall didn't just rebadge Opels, Vauxhall sold the Lotus based VX220, but then why buy a Vauxhall sports car when you can buy the cooler Lotus version? The Agila was a rebadged Suzuki Wagon R Plus, the Manara was a rebadged Holden from Australia, as was the VXR8. You can see a pattern forming here. Vauxhall could hardly be called a British car manufacturer when it sold cars designed and manufactured in other countries. But while vans continued to be produced, Luton car production ceased entirely in 2002. Vauxhall and Opel concentrated on their core line of Corsa and Astra cars, which were still top sellers, and Vauxhall was still selling more cars in the UK than everyone but Ford. With crossovers becoming popular, Vauxhall launched the Antara in 2006, along with the Mocha in 2012, and Crossland X in 2017. Parent General Motors filed for bankruptcy in 2009, selling off its Saab business. Vauxhall and Opel were going to be sold to Canadian Magna International, but GM changed their minds as they felt Vauxhall and Opel were integral to their recovery. Vauxhall continued to sell well into the 2010s, but not spectacularly. It slipped from the number 2 UK car mark to number 3 behind Volkswagen, and its share of the car market dropped from 14% in 2008 to less than 8% in 2018. And finances weren't looking too good either. Vauxhall Opel lost over $18 billion between 1997 and 2017. In 2016 alone they were losing £1 million every working day. The company was using nine different platforms across its vehicle range when other companies were saving money by developing just two or three. And with the lack of finances, the whole hybrid and electric car trend passed Vauxhall by, with the Ampera E-Rev being a rare highlight, although it was just a rebadged GM Chevy Volt. PSA owned Persia and Citroen, and they gobbled up Chrysler's European arm in 1979. In 2017, they did the same to GM's European arm, buying Vauxhall Opel for $2.3 billion, making PSA the second largest car manufacturer in Europe behind Volkswagen. They've plans to rationalise the company. Nine platforms we whittled down to just two, and with PSA paying royalties on every GM platform that goes out the factory door, there's an incentive to get it done fast. The new Corsa used a GM platform, and this was about to be released when PSA bought the company. They rushed to switch it to a PSA platform, but it still took two years to release the new car. Since 2017, PSA have been reluctant to invest in UK factories, with the uncertainty around Brexit. In 1957 there were 22,000 people working at Vauxhall, but in 2019 there were just 3,000. Automation has allowed for fewer workers with higher output, but it shows that the car industry just isn't the British jobs powerhouse it once was. So just what is a British car company? And if Vauxhall isn't British, then when did it stop being British? When GM purchased it in 1925? When Vauxhall car design ended in the 70s and 80s? When PSA bought it in 2017? And is PSA really a French company when it's owned by shareholders around the world? and has British factories and German design houses staffed by Italians and Danes. It's natural to be patriotic about your country, but with car companies it's becoming increasingly irrelevant. Vauxhall has a varied history, from steam engine maker 162 years ago, to luxury sports car maker, to a canny and innovative producer of inexpensive cars, to tanks and buses during World War II, to mass producing family cars. Time will tell how it fares in the new PSA era. 
To get early advert free access to new videos or to appear in the credits, please consider supporting me using the Patreon link below from just $1 or 80p a month and hit that subscribe button to get notified of new videos. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.